Um, so, welcome to the first edition of the EMEA online Trumo meetup, Trumo online meetup. And um, I thought that I'll maybe start with a quick introduction of myself so that you know who you are dealing with. And um, I think it's, it's after seven now, right? Uh, so, I think we can start. Um, okay, so I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, as you probably already know, my name is Kai. And... Um, I'm actually a mechanical engineer and uh, also a sales engineer, but I'm doing machine learning now for quite a while. Um, and after college, I, I joined the Bosch PhD program um, where I worked on uh, predicting the reliabil reliability of drivetrain components. And um, traditionally that was done with uh, classic statistics. And now since we nowadays collect more and especially higher dimensional data, um, we can use machine learning for that. Um, so that was kind of a um, collaborative uh, machine learning mechanical engineering task there. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to work on some really cool data sets during that time. Um, things like predicting the behavior of uh, uh, machines and uh, specifically mobile machines like excavators and agricultural machines and predicting quality and production, some other stuff, um, uh, really revolves about uh, mostly around structured data. And um, after finishing the PhD program, and I say finishing the PhD program, not the PhD, um, I decided to found a company with some of my colleagues. And um, at the moment, you're really just uh, uh, kicking off and we secured funding for the first year. And um, what we want to do is uh, bringing data science and machine learning methods to people in the manufacturing space. And uh, that, of course, without uh, several years of uh, statistics and coding. Um, well, I'll not go further into details on that. If that interests you, you can, we can follow up later or you can find me on LinkedIn or wherever. And um, yeah, so actually, I never really use deep learning professionally, and image recognition is really just more a hobby for me. Um, but I hope that uh, maybe motivates some of you to uh, that are not experts in, in in an area to pick a topic and present uh, on one of those meetups. Um, just contact me if you would like to do that, or contact Sam if you would like to do it on the US meetup. Um, yeah. Okay. So now you know who you are dealing with. And um, so just a few words on the meetup. Um, we already have some upcoming EMEA meetups. Um, so uh, this time I am gonna present uh, Capsule Networks. And in October, we are going to talk about um, relevancy and redundancy of features, especially for time series. Uh, so a colleague of mine is going to present a paper on that. And in November, uh, we'll talk about trust in prediction of ML models. Maybe some of you know the line paper and there is actually a uh, follow-up paper and uh, we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, just like I said, if you want to present, if you want to present a paper, visit trimlai.com slash meetup and, and uh, um, register if you don't uh, have already. And um, Sam is already um, also hosting um, study groups in his uh, Slack channel. So make sure you also join the Slack channel. Um, actually, I uh, uh, met Sam on the Fast AI study group. Yeah, so uh, normally um, I would overlook the chat and forward questions to the presenter if uh, someone asks a question. But since this time I'm the presenter myself, um, I need a volunteer who uh, wants to do that. So uh, is there anyone who uh, would like to watch the chat and forward questions to me? It's really not a hard task. <laughs> no one? I'm happy to do it, Kai. Awesome. Well, I haven't um, said that. How to use this thing, so I may do a poor, <laughs> I may do a poor job of it because I've never used this thing before. So. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I don't know. 
maybe we use the the zoom chat and not slack that's more so that we can see yeah okay um so now we would start with the community discussion and um, that's actually just uh, this slide is just copied from the earth meetup so um questions and comments on recent trimmel and ai shows um, luckily, we have Sam on the line this time. So um, if you have any questions about that, you can ask him now. Um, or any other topic you would like to discuss. Is there anything, any recent news? Or what, what are you working on at the moment, maybe? So just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Okay, maybe um, I'm currently trying out some uh, remote sensing stuff. So I'm, I'm looking for uh, auto encoder, uh, filling gaps, uh, like cloud gaps and stuff like that, basically imagining what would be, be beneath the clouds. So if you have clouds uh, blocking, blocking um, whatever the detection should be. So I'm just playing around with that because I read some paper, but I'm right at the beginning. So I, I might chip in later with, with some kind of Giving giving a talk about that, like but later in the year, because mm. I'm just getting getting my my hands dirty, so I'm just trying. Oh, trying that to... would that would be awesome. So it's about predicting uh, um, what you can see under the clouds, or is it uh, kind of a weather weather prediction? No, it's it's basically a bit of a uh, fancy gap filling, really, because like in, in a lot of areas you have just yeah substantial areas of the, of the image basically covered in clouds and if you do time series analysis you're missing quite a lot of spots and if you can uh, kind of gap fill based on different uh, satellite data or based on like most often what they do is there's like optical satellite data and mm -hmm. radar satellite data and the radar can penetrate clouds so they clouds don't block them so but their their resolution and their kind of information content is, is, is less. So basically what you can try is, is um, to learn some order encoder based on this radar data to gap fill the optical data and basically fill these gaps. But, oh, interesting. Yeah. Sam, so, didn't you just have something or somebody on the, on the, on the, on the podcast uh, with, with a pretty Yeah, there was one. something about that on the podcast, I think as well. It reminds me of a couple of recent podcasts. One was I did a podcast with a guy from Descartes Labs that's doing um, more like object detection from satellite imagery. Yeah. Um, but another one with a researcher and they were using uh, basically aerial images from satellites and then using GANs to generate like ground level images um, so that they can do uh, land use classification, whether it's, you know, for or residential or commercial, that kind of thing. Um, which makes me wonder if, if GANs could be used in a similar way to predict like the clear condition image from the potentially cloudy uh, satellite image. Yeah, I think I saw a paper actually where they basically used GANs to detect clouds. Like normally in the products, clouds are masked. There's like a quality layer and that indicates clouds or no clouds. But I think some guys were actually using GANs to detect is there haze or is there clouds in the image, basically, up front on the raw image, basically. So that's quite a lot of stuff going on in, in the remote sensing area. Yeah, really interesting. So there are a couple of uh, questions in the Zoom chat now. Um, I think they're all on a theme, actually, which is, are there any plans for more fast AI study groups, like for... Uh, the deep learning two um, thing, or for me, of course. Yeah, well, um, we talked about that in the last. Uh, um, well, let me see. I have to open up the chat. I can see that. One uh, one thing that I can toss out there. I need to confirm with him and figure out when he's starting. But if you didn't do the part one fast AI study group, Adzax, I know you did. Uh, but Sebastian, who was uh, who did that with us, is interested in doing another round of the part one, just to kind of reinforce that concept, those concepts for himself, and kind of lead another group through it. Uh, so if you haven't done that, um, I guess we should probably start a thread on uh, Slack about that. But you can also, you know, if you don't see one, you can start one or ping. 
uh, Sebastian, his handle is Numiri, N-U-M-I-R-I. Um, I'll start a Slack up, uh, a, a thread up in uh, the Fast AI channel shortly. Um, <clears throat> some other folks were planning to, there's another question about version three of the deep learning one. I think they're calling it version one, aren't they, Kai? It, yeah, it's the Fast AI library. Yeah, version one. Okay, so it's version three of the course and version one of the library, I guess. They're starting another version of the course with uh, a new version of the library. Um, yeah. And there was something uh, they, about how long I think it they're was. starting in October, right? And they are opening the um, international fellowship applications. I think uh, they wanted to open this in the first week of September. So maybe that's coming in the, in the next few days. Okay. There was also some discussion about it. Usually when they do the course in October, it takes till January or something for the new videos to be out. Um, so yeah. I don't recall what, there were some folks that were planning to do the deep learning two course and maybe even the ML course together, um, or at least after this. Um, but I don't know if anything has gotten organized, but if someone is, you know, wants to take the lead on pulling together a group to do the second course, uh, I think that would be great. I think I am working through or planning to work through the, uh, the deep learning book um, and the uh, fall is my busy season. So I'm not trying to take on doing another <laughs> just yet. Um, okay. I, so Pratap just asked if there will be major breaking changes or he's, uh, he doubts that he will be break, uh, major breaking changes. I think that they really completely redo the fast AI library. That's what I understood from the forums. So uh, he wants to kind of create this uh, educational version of um, um, uh, notebooks that create this library. Uh, you can read the, th the thread in the FastAI forums. So uh, they're really trying to uh, completely redo this library. Anything to do with the uh, upcoming PyTorch 1 release? Like that they... Yes, that they also, okay. yeah. They want to. They want to use PyTorch one, and they want to use the changes they they made there. Yeah, mm -hmm. like decorators and stuff. I saw. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to redo the first part of the course, you probably uh, it's it's probably good to to wait and uh, take the the new one. But um, I think the old one is valuable too. So. Yeah. You have to decide that for yourself. And actually the videos will come out, I think, next year. And they start October and then after the course finishes, the uh, in-person course finishes, you have to wait another two or three months. And then they are, um, yeah, pushing out the videos on YouTube. Okay. Okay, so if there is not something you want to discuss anymore, we can start with Capsule Networks. Okay, so Sam, if, we, uh, if you have to leave in a few minutes, um, we'll talk later. Yeah, yeah, and I will try okay. to be very, very, very careful not to press the button that says, end it for everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, do you know what's uh, what's happening with the recording when you when you leave? Is it going to to? As long as I don't press end it for everyone, it should be fine. Okay. It's it's cloud recording. Okay. Okay, so let's start with capsule networks. Um, so uh, I thought a lot about how to structure this presentation, and um, I hope that I've come up with a good way to give an introduction to the topic. Um, you can really talk hours about each point on the agenda here. And um, I hope that I got a good level of detail where it's necessary. Um, also, one thing to acknowledge, um, I will just refer to Hinton in this presentation because um, he's kind of the main figure here. But the papers are co-authored by others like um, Krzyzewski, Saber, and Frost, and also um, 
like I told you, I'm not um, actually an expert for image recognition. So there are probably some things that are not uh, described as accurate as you would find it in the textbooks. Um, so actually more than half of this talk is focusing on laying the ground of why Hinton invented capsule networks. And um, the architecture itself is not that complicated, but without reasoning why it looks like it looks, it kind of makes no sense. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is why Hinton believes that human visual perception um, is working in a very different way than what convolutional neural networks do. Um, those differences are the reasons why Hinton says that convolutional neural networks um, with pooling are fundamentally flawed. And um, so we look into what those differences are and why CNNs have problems here. And um, for this part, I'm going to assume that you know a little bit about how convolutional nets work, um, but uh, it's not a problem if you don't. Uh, I think you will get the intuition and um, you can catch up on CNNs later. Um, the next thing um, is an um, assumption Hinton makes about our visual perception system, and that is that it works similar to what he calls uh, inverse graphics. And um, that's one of the basic assumptions Hinton makes in the dynamic routing paper, and I'll try to explain, explain that a little bit. Um, right after that, we'll dig into the technical aspects on how capsules look like and um, what they do mathematically. Um, also, um, we will look at an architecture that's called CapsNet and, of course, the algorithm dynamic routing from the paper. Um, okay, so what's wrong with CNNs? Um, besides the hierarchical representation of images, so one of the most important reasons why CNNs have been so incredibly successful um, is downsampling of the feature maps um, that are generated by the convolutional layers. And whether you do that by max pooling or use increased threads in your convolutional layers, the result is basically the same. You kind of route the loudest signal through the network. And um, um, I'll only refer to max pooling in this presentation, but the same concepts apply to uh, when you use layers with uh, bigger threads. Um, okay, so this is max pooling here, this operation you see here. And um, most of you will know what it's doing. Now in this case, it's a two by two max pooling um, with a stride two. And um, you slide this uh, two by two window over your activation map and uh, pull out the maximum values um, of, the, of each grid and pass that on to the next layer. And by using max pooling, you achieve what, it's call, what is called translational invariance, um, in the detection of your features. And you probably already heard that CNNs are invariant to translation, but what does that exactly mean? Um, when you pool out the maximum value of a region in the feature map, you subsample the data to extract the strong signal and throw away all the uh, neighboring weaker signals. And that means uh, that you also throw away the information about the exact position of the activation, right? So for each step of your pooling operation, you afterwards don't know the previous, previous position of the strongest rotation. So when you have this 20 here, you don't know where it was uh, in the layer before. Um, so by throwing away this information, you achieve that it does not matter that much where on the image uh, the feature you want to detect is located. Um, and uh, going deeper into the network, you slowly lose more and more of this spatial information. Um, okay, so you probably also heard that CNNs are not invariant to rotation, scale, or various other um, uh, transformations like view angles or, and stuff like that. And this is sometimes a little bit counterintuitive because um, when you look at models trained on MNIST or ImageNet, um, you will see that they work with pictures that are rotated a little bit or where the object is a little bit bigger or smaller. Uh, so you could ask yourselves, why is that even possible that um, um, when CNNs are not invariant to those kind of transformations? Um, so let's have a look at um, how this works by walking through an example of recognizing a simpler 
object like uh, handwritten digit, for example. So let's say you want to classify the digit five in an image. And this five can, of course, have different orientations, like, uh, for example, slightly different angles, or maybe uh, one five is a little bit bigger than another five. And um, this is the reason why during training, we did not just show the network one type of five, but hundreds or thousands of it. You couldn't train a handwritten digit classifier with only a few examples. Um, and it's not just the data set itself that contains so many pictures. Additionally, we are training it with augmentation, which means that um, we artificially generate altered versions of the data with rotations and zoomings, for example. And so because of training the network with a lot of different types of files, we now have several filters in this network that respond when they see a five and how strong they are activated corresponds to the orientation of the five you showed the network. And um, in order to have a model that can generalize uh, in finding a handwritten five, we need to find a way to route this strong, the strongest signal through the network. And that's exactly what pooling does. Um, it makes sure that if any of those filters has a high activation, um, this is pulled out of the feature map. And um, what we achieve here is um, an, an invariance of the internal representation. And no matter how our five is oriented, uh, the re representation of it in the network does not change. We'll always have this scalar activation and feature map. Um, okay, so routing the information through the network is actually one of the most important aspects in, in hierarchical learning systems. Um, what I just described here is kind of the CNN way of routing the information through the network until you eventually recognize the, the object you want to recognize. And it's a little bit crude and it's kind of a brute force way um, to have invariance for different types of transformation uh, because you just train a bunch of filters that can detect uh, different versions of your object. And um, that's actually one of the big problems with CNNs. Um, the way um, this routing works. Uh, um, this routing works really good, but it also introduces all kinds of problems. Um, it's so invariant that it would even classify images like uh, this here, for example, on the right side, um, as a face, because uh, the special information of the features is lost mm. by downsampling the CNN, uh, the picture, the the data in in the CNN and um, by don't caring about the uh, position of the features. Um, the intention of pooling was to introduce orientational proportional invariances to the object you want to recognize. But unfortunately, it also introduced this, uh, yeah, kind of ugly types of invariance. And um, actually, for this kind of crude approach to represent an image, CNNs uh, are working extraordinarily well. And Hinton uh, describes the fact that they are so good as a complete disaster, because in the end they are doomed because of these properties. And um, while the idea of having a hierarchical representation of features like you have in CNNs is very good, he says that it's a very bad idea to try to introduce invariance to an Im uh, image recognition system. Um, in fact, pooling was introduced uh, in a very old architecture, I think from the 80s. Um, it's called the Neocognitron. And it was the predecessor to modern CNNs. And um, they used pooling to achieve uh, this kind of invariance for um, classifying handwritten digits, like you would do with MNIST. And um, for that case, pooling is perfectly fine. A digit is a 2D object. They needed a way to generalize for different positions and um, slightly different rotations and scalings. And here, pooling works at its best. At its best. And um, unfortunately, we never got rid of this pooling uh, um, stuff. And although modern image recognition is much more challenging than that, um, I mean, today we look at pictures that show complex 3D scenes with different viewing angles and different lighting situations and object sizes. And um, yeah, so that's the reason why we need so much data to train these things. Um, okay. 
So are there any questions so far? Or is that somehow clear? Okay. So yeah, the slides will also I'll just see the question here. Um, so uh, the slides will be available. I will um, post a link on Slack later on. Um, okay, so now think about how you learn to recognize objects. Um, so let's say someone shows you an animal you've never seen before. And you don't need thousands of pictures from all different viewing angles to be able to recognize this animal. You just need a few images and then you can recognize it even if you see it in a different orientation. So um, look at these pictures here, for example. Um, you immediately recognize that this is a Statue of Liberty. And that shows that the internal representation of an image in your brain does not depend on the position um, viewing angle and lighting conditions. Um, this information is in your visual perception, not lost like in a CNN. Um, again, if you want to have a CNN that recognizes all those different pictures, you have to train it with massive amounts of data to have detectors for all different kinds of viewing angles, lighting conditions, and stuff like that. Um, so your vision system has an inbuilt sense of geometry. Um, the relationship of each feature in, in our hierarchical representation in the brain is, uh, is preserved in our brain, um, which makes it easy for us to recognize it from different uh, viewing angles. Um, so um, what we want to achieve is invariance of the viewpoint. And um, there is actually a field that knows a lot about uh, viewpoint invariance, and that is computer graphics. And Hinton assumes uh, that our visual perception is performing something very similar to computer graphics in reverse order uh, in order to recognize objects on images. And he calls that inverse graphics. And we will have a look into that now. Um, okay, so um, first, um, it is important to make clear how computer graphics work in general. Um, to render an image from a 3D scene, the render engine, of course, needs to know where all the objects of your scene are. And it also needs to know um, that positions with respect to the chosen viewpoint, or let's say the virtual camera. Um, if you think about, it makes no sense to, define, to define this uh, your objects with respect to this viewpoint, because um, the essence of computer graphics is that you can create images from every viewpoint you want to you wanna choose, right? Um, so what we do in computer graphics is composing objects of simpler, more primitive objects and represent the whole as a hierarchy, as a hierarchy of those simpler objects. And the connections in this hierarchy are so-called pose matrices that uh, define the orientation with respect to the next hierarchical level. So... Um, have a look at this uh, uh, tree, abstracted tree, hierarchical tree of Comet Mr. B. Um, um, I have this picture from an, uh, from an awesome blog post, which is linked here. So um, when I'll send out the slides, you can uh, copy the link and, and have a look at this blog post. Um, so on top of the tree, we'll find what I call the whole. In this uh, case, it's a person or Mr. B. And in the next hierarchical level, we have a part of it, like for example, the face. And um, the position of the face with respect to the person is defined by the pose matrix M. And one level deeper, we'll find uh, the mouse. And here the pose matrix N defines the position of the mouse with respect to the face. And um, so here comes the magic of computer graphics. When you multiply the matrix M with the matrix N, you will get the position from the mouse with respect to the person. And that's really awesome because when you have this kind of representation, you only have to define the position of the person and um, then you just do a bunch of matrix multiplications and boom, you know all the positions uh, and orientations of every object in the image. And um, GPUs are actually designed to do exactly that. Um, of course, this, uh, uh, this picture here is uh, brutally simplified. 
and uh, there are all sorts of other properties like lightning for example um, but this is how it generally works and uh, this post matrix um, contains the translation and the rotation and scale of the of the object um, you want to describe in relation to uh, the next layer and uh, Hinton assumes that our vision system is doing something that's um, similar to the exact opposite called inverse graphics. Um, so let's go back to the Statue of Liberty. Um, here. So when we look at these images, our brain tries to estimate the viewpoints through which we see the statue. Uh, you can easily imagine how a rotation of it would look like. And that kind of shows that uh, we use a pretty similar representation. We also know that our brain does uh, a hierarchical kind of recognition. And yeah, so uh, there's a very interesting one hour talk by, by Geoffrey Hinton, uh, which you can find on YouTube uh, by searching inverse graphics. And this is really interesting. Um, it shows some really compelling ideas and thought experiments to argue that our vision works like that. Um, it's definitely worth watching. Um, so make sure you, you have a look at this. Um, okay, so if we take all of that without just explain series, uh, we have to look for a model that can represent features with higher dimensional representations. And Capsules are the main idea behind that. Um, in fact, they are not new. Hinton thought about this idea and this kind of representation for almost 30 years, I think. And um, the idea of a capsule is actually not that different from a filter in a convolutional neural network, um, except that it represents the features not only with scalar value, but with a higher dimensional vector that um, represents all sorts of different properties like the pose I just uh, um, talked about or lightning and colors and, and, and other properties. Um, and we will call that properties from now on instantiation parameters. Um, we'll go into the details of, uh, of the operations shown here in this table um, in the next part. So the most important thing is that the activation that is generated by a capsule represents two things. Um, and that is, uh, the length of the vector that describes the probability if a feature was detected or not, and the orientation of the vector contains the um, high dimensional representation of our instantiation parameters. Um, okay, so first, um, maybe we should remember what a filter in a convolutional net does. When it detects a feature, it is calibrated for it um, uh, outputs a higher scalar value to indicate uh, that this feature exists. So um, a capsule should instead output a vector that also captures, captures those, in, those uh, instantiation parameters I mentioned. Um, okay, so what happens if, for example, the viewpoint of an object we want to detect changes? The, activation vector representing those instantiation parameters is changing too, but the length indicating that the presence uh, of the feature is there does not. Okay, we'll go a little bit more into detail uh, about that um, in the next uh, section. And this is really only just the idea how it should be. Um, and as I mentioned, it took Hinton another and other researchers um, really like 30 years um, to figure out how a way to create a, a model out of this. And um, CapsNet and dynamic routing, uh, which just came out at the end of last year, are this uh, result. And we will look into that now. Um, but first, are there any questions? Well, I know it's a little bit weird maybe to understand, but um, I hope that this kind of um, yeah, introduction to how this idea um, um, was born is, uh, uh, is helpful in the, next, in the next section. So no questions? Okay. There is a, there's a question up in the uh, Zoom chat uh, a yeah. few times. Um, so one is what kind of activation function uh, does the capture use? 
Um, so the, uh, I'll come to that later. The activation or the nonlinearity in a, in a capsule layer is called squashing. And it's, um, I will show how this works, but um, it's really just think about, um, I will show that in a minute, but it's really just stacked activations. So if you have a, uh, um, like a few feature maps in a convolutional network and stack them together, you will end up with a vector instead of a scalar value. So it's really just not one value in one feature map, in one 2D feature map, but it's um, a number of activations in a stacked feature map. And I will go into detail on that uh, um, in, in the next section. So it's really just replace the scalar value that's um, created by the convolution layer um, by a vector. Uh, so then another one, which is, uh, so you just multiply matrices which contain the object representation and you get the complete image. Um, in computer graphics? Yes. So, uh, wait a second. You mean you're talking about this here? This M times N? Okay. Um, so, so in computer graphics, you initially define where the person is in, in, your, in your picture. And then um, when you multiply all those pose matrices that define how the objects are related to the next layer, so the, the upper layer, then you really just have to uh, multiply those matrices to get the absolute position in the image you want to have. And you know all the uh, positions of the object in, uh, in your scene you want to render. Okay, and then <clears throat> Amy is kind of after a bit of clarity on what the vectors are. So yeah, don't I think I'll just go. I'll just go on. I will explain that uh, how that works with with the vector. How this this capsule layer is is uh, actually built in, in a in a model. So maybe that's going to be clear. And if not, you, uh, just ask the question again after after I show this. Strings. Yeah, you are. Yeah. John is uh, pretty much right. So the length of the vector, when you calculate the length of the vector, it indicates if a feature that, it, that this capsule want to detect is there or not. So higher number, higher scalar value in this, uh, in this case means that uh, it's more confident that this feature is present. And um, the, the direction of the vector indicates this uh, instantiation parameters, like for example, rotation or, or um, in, in a higher dimensional sp uh, space, there are also other parameters that you can cover with this uh, vector. Okay. I have one other quick question, sorry. Um, yes. Get onto this sure. <clears throat> I'm wondering whether, so these vectors represent kind of, you know, um, the pose and lighting and scale and so on, uh, properties of things in the image. Yeah. Are they like learned features? So it just learns that like lighting is a useful thing to kind of represent or is that somehow like hard coded in the architecture? No, no, that's they, you learn these features and um, it's basically, it's, it's, um, um, it is very similar to a convolution layer. We'll see that in the, in the next section. So you really, um, uh, it's basically the same like a convolution layer, but you just group this, uh, the activations you get out of this in a certain way and you have a different method of training it. And um, you will get this when I, uh, when I go on with, uh, with CapsNet and dynamic routing. Um, so, um, okay. So most of the things or, or a lot of the things I show you now is um, so the way I describe the architecture and the training algorithm is by um, inspired by a very very good blog post by a guy who's called Nick Bordakos. Um, I found it on Medium, and um, he also created an awesome interactive visualization tool which I will use uh, um, in the explanation, and he shared that on GitHub. GitHub. Um, you will find the links at the end of my presentation. So um, if you want to have a look into that. And um, so in the next part, I will switch between uh, pictures of the architecture and this uh, uh, visualization while I explain that. Um, okay, so this here is the overall architecture of CapsNet. And uh, Hint used this architecture in the recent paper uh, for training the MNIST dataset. And most of you will know that. Um, 
the most basic problem you can solve in computer vision is amnest. Um, you basically have to show that you can reach state of the art in order to claim that you are onto something. And um, the trained network looks like this. And um, it's actually a little bit different during training and uh, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so as you can see, the first layers uh, in this uh, network are ordinary convolutional layers. And you would find those layers in, in any kind of, of convolutional neural network. And um, I don't know if that's actually 100% accurate, but I guess they do that because they want to get this uh, kind of lowest level features, lines and edges and stuff like this uh, in the object representation tree I just showed. Um, so those layers will detect simple features, edges, lines, and uh, we can have a look at this in this visual visualization tool I just talked about. Uh, okay, wait a second. Um, we'll open this up. Got this running on my... Yeah, awesome. Can you see that? Great. Um, okay, so um, let's choose the picture of a four. Okay, so this is the input image um, for this for the network. And um, this here is the output of the first convolutional layer. Um, we have 256 filters in this layer, nine by nine convolution. And this is the output um, after we applied the ReLU function. So it's really just an ordinary convolutional layer with ReLU activation. So 256 classic uh, feature maps um, with size 20 by 20. Um, it's the result of a nine by nine convolution on the uh, MNIST pictures, which have 28 by 28 pixels. And um, the next layer is called primary caps layer. Let me switch to the, yeah. So the next layer is called primary caps layer. And um, it starts off as a normal convolution layer. So we have our stack of this 256 activa activation maps from our first convolution layer that I just showed. And uh, so in the next layer, we would start with a nine by nine by 256 kernel on this stack. And we use a stride of two. So normally that would result in a stack of 256 six by six uh, activation maps. Um, but this time we are not just stacking it like in the first convolution layer, but we're doing something different. We slice the result in a deck of 32 sub decks. You can see this here. And um, in those sub decks are eight activation maps each. And those decks um, are called capsule layers. And they consist of 36 vectors here, when you have a look in detail on it, um, consists of 36 vectors. And um, those vectors are also called capsules. So there are 36 capsules in each of these capsule layers. Um, so we have a vector length of eight for each of the capsules. And uh, this is very important. Um, I hope that somehow makes sense what I'm explaining here. Um, so maybe it's good to ask a question now if, if you did not understand this. So it's, it's really just a different way of organizing this, uh, uh, this feature maps. And the convolutional part is, is, is the same. So it's, uh, it's also called a convolutional capsule layer. Okay, so we do this kind of uh, um, slicing of the, of the feature maps. And we, we just define that this vectors that result here uh, should be the, the, capsule, the capsules. And at the moment, we do not know how to train this thing and um, um, how to get this vector to learn this instantiation parameters I just talked about. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, to support this, um, here is a, a picture that compares a capsule layer with a classic convolution layer. And um, it's simplified. Um, because our vector here has um, eight dimensions, uh, of course. Um, but for example, if you want to detect a certain shape with a convolutional layer, you just get a simple uh, lay, uh, number or, <clears throat> or pixel out of your activation map. 
while the capsule outputs a vector. And um, its direction represents the instantiation of the parameter. So in this case, it's really the, the direction in which they are oriented, but in the case of, of our CapsNet architecture, it's a, yeah, it's a kind of a higher dimensional representation um, of how these objects are shaped. And actually myself, I don't know if this is accurate, but I kind of compare this to, to embeddings. So maybe if you know what embeddings are, you can probably kind of compare these concepts. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff. Is uh, there any questions so far? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering with this, uh, you talk about direction, how, how does different like uh, instances of these features actually give you a direction? I don't really get the direction angle. What do you mean? Yeah, well, like, when... actually direction in, in, like in, in, in a planar space, is it actually direction that you're talking about? Or is it like... Yeah, it is, it is. It is direction, but it, it's not the direction you uh, you would have in a 2D or 3D space. It's actually, it's a direction in a higher dimensional space. So okay. you can also, every vector, uh, no matter how, how high its dimensionality is, has a direction. But yeah. actually, of course, for an eight dimensional vector, you can't kind of have an, uh, a visual representation of how this uh, would look like. But okay, the, so it's basically in, in the feature space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Was the intuition around kind of slicing up the um, convolutional features into lots of eight? I guess eight is just an arbitrary like hyperparameter somehow. But do you, have, yeah. do you have intuition around why like that is a helpful thing, or is, it, is again that something that will become? Yeah. Clear? It's actually a hyperparameter, yes. And um, you kind of choose the. I don't know why why you start with an eight here. But in the next um, capture layer, it's, um, it's 16. The dimension is 16. And you do that because in the, in the higher, next higher level, you want to have uh, a more complex concept of, your, of things you want to detect. So in these lower levels, you, um, like in a convolution net, you detect um, more simple features. And in the higher levels, you, you get to more complex concept and you want to have a higher dimension to represent this. Um, I'll show a pretty cool um, visualization in this tool I showed you uh, that shows how this actually this this numbers here in this in the vector that are here when you change them artificially you can see how the how the picture is changing. I will show that uh, at the end of the of the talk. So yeah, it's it's a hyperparameter. Cool. And then there's another question in chat, which is, could the higher dimensional encoding capture info about peculiarities of the object and not just rotation? Um, what do you mean by particularities? I, I think they're cast, kind of asking, like, is it, is it more general than just rotation? So I guess it's yeah. similar thing to the question I asked, yeah. earlier, like, it, it can learn, you know, yeah. to choose to represent lighting or scale or, you know, uh, yeah, our kind of arbitrary. Yeah, so it is. It is not only just the rotation or the the translation of the object. Um, these higher dimensional representations actually capture a lot of different things. Like for the MS dataset, for example, we later on see that it um, it captures things like the the stroke, how you how you uh, paint this number and the uh, rotation and the size and um, of the skew of the um, uh, of the numbers, so um, you in in when you do it with pictures, you can also get um, things like texture and stuff like this. So it really captures a lot more than just the just the position. Yeah, so I, I think you're right. It actually sounds like an embedding. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me look at my notes. Um, okay. Okay, so um, now let us assume that what I just told you here is true <laughs> and that this, uh, this capsules here are already trained to output what we want, to output this kind of instantiation parameters I was talking about. Um, I will explain how, but um, I promise. But um, let's just assume that for now. So what would a good machine learning 
engineer do after a linear layer, what this is, in a neural network? Yes, he would apply a nonlinearity. Um, and this is in the case of this CapsNet architecture, the squashing function. Um, and when you look at this formula here, you will see that it scales the vector so that its length lies between zero and one, so that we can interpret it as a probability. And it preserves the orientation, but it scales the vector down. And, um, okay, so let's go back to the visualization. Um, this picture is showing the length of each vector. No, wait, wait. Uh, okay, so after that, after the squashing function, after squashing all of these vectors, we are done with our capsule layer. This is what a capsule layer looks like. So what do we do now? Um, in a classic convolutional network, before we go into the next layer, we would do pooling. And remember that I said that pooling is kind of a primitive form of routing the relevant signals through, uh, through the network. Um, in CAPSNET, this is much more sophisticated and uh, it's called dynamic routing by agreement. And um, I will use this, uh, um, this awesome, very simplified picture by Aurélien Giron, is his name? Um, to help understand the intuition behind that. And uh, this is from a really excellent explanation video. You will find the link here. He's probably going to explain that better than me. Um, so make sure you have a look at this. Um, okay, so let we assume that we have a simple capsule network that can detect a, a house or a boat consisting of a square or a triangle. So um, depending on how you orient this, uh, these two shapes, you can uh, either detect a house or um, a boat. And, um, okay, so lower level capsules in this network can detect uh, those shapes here and their pose. And the higher level capsules uh, are for detecting whether this is a house or a boat. And during dynamic routing, we predict the activations of the next layer based on the lower level capsules. So the capsules that are predicting uh, or capturing these uh, lower level features like the, the shapes here are trying to predict what the next layer would see. And um, that's what you see on the right side here. So depending on um, um, if the uh, capsule that detects this square object here um, sends the signal to uh, the uh, boat uh, capsule of the next layer or the house layer of the next uh, uh, capsule, um, a house would look like this and a boat would look like this. And as you can see, the boat um, in this predictions, uh, this both pre predictions look pretty similar while the house does not. So they agree on the existence uh, of the boat and can therefore conclude that it's a boat and not a house. And then they can just send their signal to the correct capsule, which is the boat capsule. So that's, that's just the intuition behind how dynamic routing works. Um, I'll, I'll try to at least try to explain how this works. So um, coming back to, to MNIST and CAPSNETs, um, we want to have this kind of routing between our primary CAPS layer, that's the layer I just explained, and the digit CAPS layer. This is the uh, second uh, capsule layer in the network. And this digit capsule layer, we have um, 10 capsules. And because that's because we want to have, uh, uh, we are having 10 digits that we want to predict. And um, the dimensionality of each of these vectors is uh, 16. And as I just said, it's just defined. So you want to have more like in, um, uh, in, in this uh, um, uh, layer because you want to cover more complex stuff in these uh, higher levels of, of the network. Um, so we already talked how, about how the activations of the primary caps layer are calculated and how we get out these vectors. Um, oops, that was not on purpose. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do we do this kind of prediction I was just uh, talking about? And we do that by calculating the dot product of the activation vector we get out of the primary caps layer. 
with a transformation matrix. This is this here um, for each connection of the capsule and the primary caps layer to the digit caps layer. So each of the capsules here has one connection to each of these capsules here. And we are calculating the dot product with a weight matrix that is shaped eight by 60. Um, so now remember the picture of comic Mr. Bean some slides ago. Um, the relation between each part in this, uh, in this hierarchical tree was defined by a pose matrix. And this is, ex this is exactly what lies in this, uh, in this weight matrix. So the, the relation between those uh, uh, two capsules is described in this weight matrix. Um, uh, of course, this weight matrix is in a higher dimensional space than only this translational and rotational stuff, representing more properties than just pose. But um, for now, we don't know how to route the correct signal through. So at the moment, all this, it's a dense connected layer. There are all connections and we have all these uh, weight matrices and we don't know how to route this through. So we have to introduce routing weights, just a scalar value for each connection to the, uh, between these capsules to, uh, to kind of route the signal through. Um, so we define this, uh, um, this routing weights. And um, so again, when we calculate the product of the weight matrix with the activation uh, vector from the primary caps layer, we predict this digit caps vector. And we have 32 capsules in, in the primary caps uh, layer, and each of these 32 capsule layers has 36 capsules, which uh, result in 1,152 capsules in this uh, primary caps uh, seg segment of the, of the uh, model. Um, so each of these capsules predicts one in this digit caps layer, one of these digit caps layers. So that results in 1,152 times 10, which is 11,520 predictions. So we have a lot of predictions in here and we don't know how to handle them. And there, this routing algorithm comes, um, comes uh, on the field. And um, okay, so in the next step of dynamic routing, we wanna calculate how much those predictions agree with each other. That's just what I showed um, with the boat and the shapes. We do that by calculating the distance to the mean vector of all these predictions. And um, so the distance describes how much each prediction agree with the mean. And with this distance, we can update this scalar routing weight I just introduced um, of each vector accordingly in such a way that a bigger distance corresponds with a smaller weight. So after this weight update, we calculate the mean again and we repeat this process. And after we do that about three to five times, that's uh, um, defined in the, the paper, um, the weights represent how the signal should be routed through the network so that uh, the predictions agree with each other. And it's important to remember that we, we have to do this kind of routing and finding the correct um, routing weights to get the correct signal through the network every time we show it a picture. It's not only just when we do training or when we do inference, but every time we pass a picture through this network, you have to do this kind of routing to know where to put the um, uh, features and find out where the uh, capsules agree on the most. Well, I know that this is not very easy to understand. I, I mean, I did that uh, for, uh, in preparation for this presentation, but I certainly did not understand this the first time I heard about that. I had to read, I think, maybe 10 blog posts or something like this to, to really understand what's happening here. So I don't know if there are any questions, but... Uh, You can ask them now. <laughs> so Ws, you, you kind of have to find the values for them even during inference. It's not just like yeah. during the training stage. Yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's, and that's what I understood. So um, you're generating this kind of uh, rich feature set in your, in your primary caps layer, and then you have to try to find out how the agreement between those two layers is. And then you route the information through the, uh, through the network for each instance. That's what I understood. 
so the um, the uh, the algorithm of repeating this three to five times iteratively is a little bit more complex than what I explained. Um, there is a softmax to guarantee that the weights um, you are defining sum up to one. And also, of course, uh, uh, squashing is applied uh, at the nonlinearity, um, but that's mainly it. And um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure that it's repeated for every picture you show the net, regardless of your training or in inference mode. You have to do this every time. Um, so this dynamic routing algorithm is not a replacement for backpropagation. We still need backpropagation with, uh, with a loss function to, to train the first convolutional layer and the weights in this uh, matrices between the capture layers. Um, it's only responsible for routing the correct features through the next layer for each instance. It's kind of a very advanced version of max pooling. So the backpropagation is process is uh, perform performed like you would uh, do it in any other neural network. Um, the paper tried it actually in three different ways. Um, the architecture shown on the slide is the, the most simple one. Um, at the end, you just calculate the length of the vectors um, you, of the 16 dimensional vectors and uh, the length of the vectors correspond with the probability of the existence of the certain digit. So when the first uh, has a length near to one, then uh, it's uh, certain that there is a zero in this case. Um, it's use, you use classic cross entropy to, to make back propagation in this uh, kind of network. And the second way is to use a margin loss function. Um, and this uh, function uh, allows for multiple instances in one image. So this is actually one of the big strengths of, capture, strengths of capture networks. They are very good at finding overlapping instances of these digits. So when you have two digits and you kind of just overlap this in one picture, then it's really good at finding uh, the two different digits here. I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? The features are routed in a way through the network so that all captures are most happy and agree on each other. And that's why it can very uh, good um, differentiate between the two uh, uh, digits uh, they see. Um, but the most interesting way of, of, of training this is the third one. And um, this one adds a decoder network um, at the end of uh, the network, of at the end of the digit caps layer in addition to the margin loss function. And uh, since the digit caps uh, capsules contain this information, this high dimensional information, if a digit is present and also the instantiation parameters, it should be possible to reconstruct the original image from this, from this vector. And to do that, um, we pick the correct digit caps vector that corresponds to our class label and put it through a dense decoder network like shown here in the picture. And it outputs 784 pixels of the original MNIST digit. And by comparing it to the or original picture and calculating a reconstruction loss, we can train it to reconstruct the image. And the final loss is then calculated by the margin loss plus 0 0.0005 times the reconstruction loss. And um, you do that because um, you want to make sure that the margin loss is the dominating uh, um, a loss in this in this function and the reconstruction loss kind of acts as a regularizer and it makes sure that the capsules learn this instantiation parameters I was just talking about um, because they are necessary to reconstruct this image. So this decoder network makes sure that the um, vectors in the in the capsule layers learn this uh, this instantiation parameters. And that's actually pretty cool because we can have a look at this reconstructions that are generated in this, uh, in this layer. And uh, so let's uh, again switch to the visualization tool and go to the reconstruction tab. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is the reconstruction for the number four we showed the network. Um, and all the sliders here, in this, so there are 16 sliders and they represent the numbers in the digit caps output vector. 
and we can just artificially change them. And what we see is that when we change this vector, they are actually changing parameters like stroke, rotation, thickness, form of the, of the four. And that shows that the, the capsule networks actually really learned this uh, higher dimensional representation. So what I'm doing by changing the sliders is really just artificially changing the output of the network and then putting it through the decoder network. So that's the proof that it really learns this kind of high dimensional representation of how this uh, um, four would look like. And yes, Cornel, Jack. Hello? Did someone have a question? Well, okay. I would ask a quick one. Um, so each yeah. slider is, is controlling one capsule? No, each slider is, um, wait, I'm go back to the picture. Um, each slider is, so in this case we have a four, so we have the uh, digit caps vector number four here. And um, this is what we take out of the, the result of the network and then we put it through the decoder network. And when we change one of the numbers, in this activation map. That's what I changed with the sliders here. Okay. And um, this 16 dimensional ve vector is representing the higher dimensional um, instantiation parameters. And when I change them, I change stuff like the stroke or the shape. I skew it a little bit or rotate it a little bit and make it bigger or smaller. So um, yeah, that's the proof that it actually really re learned those parameters. And actually, I'm really thrilled to see what, what's going to happen when people apply this to ImageNet. So imagine what's going to happen when you kind of change the representation in this high dimensional vector and see what uh, is going to be reconstructed by the network. That's really going to be interesting. Have there been other people taking it up yet? I mean, I'm, I haven't really read about capsules yet, but is it like, I mean, I think it's a cool concept, but is there already applications in other areas? Have you seen anything? Uh, I don't know if there's, uh, if there's if there are applications, but um, they are actually pretty promising for segmentation tasks. Um, I think you can imagine why they are good for that because they capture all this information. And, um, Actually, at the moment, I think it's um, it's pretty hard to train them. It's uh, you need a lot of computational power to do this dynamic routing stuff in each. I mean, you have to do it to do it for each image you show the network, and that's uh, mm -hmm. computationally pretty pretty extensive. So it's um, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. So okay. we'll see how that works. I mean, um, they are really just at, at a point where convolutional networks were maybe in I don't know 2011. So um, uh, depending on how many people start to research this stuff, there's probably going to be some very interesting uh, uh, stuff in the future. Okay. And I actually I find that kind of connecting this to the to the visual perception system of the of the human brain that is kind of uh, I think it's really interesting and it's, it's very promising to do it like that because I mean we know that we have a really good vision system in build. Okay, so maybe really quick, just uh, um, the pros of the architecture. Kai, uh, sorry, there, there are a couple more questions backed up in the chat. Um, sure, sure, sure. So uh, this question, uh, lower capsules predict how higher capsules see things. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, yeah. so, um, so the the lower level capsules that um, get the more simple features um, are trying to predict what is the, what the next level would look like uh, if the shape was like this. So when you have this picture of the face in mind where all those features are in a, in a, in a wrong position, um, you would find that the um, um, prediction in the next layer would look like, okay, there is a face down here and there's a face up here, but they don't really agree on each other. So all those capsules in the, in the next layer say, okay, the face should be, uh, the face should be here. And the other says, oh no, the face should be here if the eye is here, if the left eye is here. And if the mouse is here, the face should be here. And they don't agree on that. And that is actually the distance in the, uh, uh, in the vector, in this prediction vector. 
And when you calculate the, 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 this distance, you can see how much those predictions agree on each other. And when you find that, okay, um, this feature is putting his uh, vector into the, the face detecting capsule, then it predicts that the face is here. And then another feature that's, for example, uh, predicting that there is a right eye, um, puts its feature to the uh, face recognizing capsule, then the capsule says the same. It says, okay, the face should be here. And that means that they agree on each other. And when they do that, you can be more confident that there really is a face at this, at this position. So that's kind of the intuition behind that. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's another question, but everyone's helping each other out in chat, so that's great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <Awesome. laughs> whether uh, this is kind of just used for image classification, and I think you kind of covered this before we got to the question, but someone has also, um, uh, I think, provided a link to um, an application in text classification. Uh, so yeah. that's cool. uh, someone was asking visualization that you uh, showed but um, yeah again someone else helped out with uh, posting the line. yeah so I actually can't hear when you are uh, um, pressing a button on your on your keyboard I think ah, sorry <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> um, yeah I, I think um, it's actually pretty similar to a convolutional network and um, it probably can be used for all the applications you can use a, a ConfNet. Um, I've seen um, implementations for segmentation, for example, and yeah, generative models, that's pretty clear. Um, yeah, that's up to the researchers that will do some cool stuff with that. Cool. Um, one last question for now uh, from Amy. Yep who's asked, uh, can you roughly estimate how much less data um, you need with CAPSnet compared to a traditional CNN? Oh, actually I can't. In, in, the, um, in the network, uh, in, the, in the paper, they uh, use the complete MNIST data set. Um, but um, you maybe can have an intuition about that when you see uh, the number of parameters you have in the network. And that's about, in the convolutional networks, I think, there are about 10 times as much uh, parameters you have to tune than in the um, in a uh, capsule network. So that means that you uh, are consider you need considerably amount, uh, less data for for training it. Uh, but I actually don't know how, how much it is, and I think that will uh, show uh, that will be shown in the future when people try to train it on ImageNet and stuff like that. Okay, so we are already more than on top of the hour. So that was it, I think, for the first meetup. And I hope I will see you on the next one. We will um, we will announce it via mail again. And yeah, if you have any questions, contact me. And have a nice evening. Uh, thank you so much. It was very nice. Thanks, Kai. Thank yep. yeah, thank thanks, Kai, for explanation. Yeah. Thanks, Kai. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.